Good morning. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the fourth in our series of five 30-minute webinars exploring a number of themes on whistleblowing. Uh, my name is Andrew Brakewell. I'm Commercial Director for EQS Group in the UK, uh, where we provide a range of digital compliance solutions to organizations of all sizes. If you've missed the first three webinars in this current series, you can still register online and watch the recordings using the link you should be seeing on your screen um, in a second. You can also register for the final webinar, which will be next week at the same time. And in that webinar, we'll be discussing how to embed an effective speak up culture uh, within your organization. So, so far we've looked at the impact of the EU whistleblowing directive as it transposes into local laws. Um, we've also discussed the process of choosing and implementing a new whistleblowing system. So this week, we'll be examining how to respond to whistleblower reports and also how to conduct uh, effective, in, uh, effective investigations. And I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Annabelle Curley today, uh, who's a partner at the global advisory firm Stone Turn. Uh, I'll ask Annabelle uh, to introduce herself uh, shortly, but good morning, Annabelle. Thanks for joining. Good morning, Andrew. Uh, we have a lot to cover in the next 30 minutes, um, but your participation is really important to us. So we've allowed time towards the end of this session to answer any questions uh, you might want to raise during the discussion. So as any questions come to mind, please enter them into the panel, which you'll see at the bottom of the screen. and We'll get to as many of those as possible uh, during the next uh, 30 minutes or after the main discussion. You'll also see some other functions available to you on this webinar uh, platform. Any questions that we're not able to get to, then we can respond um, individually uh, after the event. So uh, without further ado, uh, welcome once again, Annabelle, and thanks for joining us today. Perhaps I can start just by asking you to tell us uh, a little bit about yourself and uh, your role at Stone Turn. Sure, thanks, Andrew. Good morning, everyone. So as Andrew said, I'm Annabelle Curley. I'm a partner at the global forensics firm Stone Turn and I specialize in civil regulatory and criminal investigations. Uh, in past lives, I've been seconded to the Serious Fraud Office in the UK, and I also spent five years in the Enforcement Division of the Financial Conduct Authority at the height of the financial crisis. Thanks, Edabel. So you spent, I think, almost 20 years uh, performing investigations for organizations of a range of different sizes in many different sectors and from many different perspectives. So, and those include sort of, I think, internal investigations, uh, regulatory investigations, criminal investigations. So with all of that experience, can you give us an overview of what you regard as best practice in effectively managing an investigation? Sure. So I think overall, the aim of when you're responding to a whistleblower report should be to conduct a focused, efficient, cost-effective investigation that is fair to all parties involved. And whatever the context, there are some aspects of an investigation that apply across the board and are non-negotiable if your investigation is to be effective. In essence, I think the four cornerstones around which any investigation needs to be built are preparation and planning, performance, conclusion and reporting, and then lessons learned. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, uh, on the first of those, focusing a little bit more on the first of those stages, you know, what, do, what does good preparation and planning look like uh, in detail? So, I mean, so I often see that this, this isn't done properly necessarily, and sometimes that can cause real problems down the line. So I think the very first thing is to define your scope. So analyze exactly what's been alleged, what offenses may have been committed, um, or what regulatory provisions may have been infringed, by whom, and then set the scope accordingly. And of course, no one size fits all. So you need to do this on a case by case basis and bear in mind that scope can change quite significantly as an investigation progresses. In addition, you need to think about proportionality. So one valid question at the outset of any investigation is always, should we investigate this at all? And if so, to what extent? Then you need to think about all, mapping all the potential sources of evidence there might be out there, to think through those and, and set them out it, almost in a mind map, if you like. You may need to talk to colleagues in IT, for example, if appropriate, um, although you need to bear in mind um, keeping the circle of knowledge about the investigation uh, smaller rather than larger. 
You'll then need to think about um, preserving that evidence. Um, you might need to suspend auto deletion or auto archive functions. Um, you might need to issue document retention notices, both internally and potentially externally to um, various parties. And sources of evidence, of course, may well include interviews. So you need to think about who you're going to interview, in what order, where, and on what basis, whether that will be you know, voluntary, part of an HR process, or some comp other compelled process. Of course, you need to think about time frame for your information gathering and your analysis. Um, and you need to definitely include interim review touch points to think about where you are in the investigation and where you should go next. And I think another area that um, isn't necessarily focused on um, fully in the planning of investigations always is around mapping stakeholders, um, particularly for complex high stakes investigations. You might need to consider um, internal stakeholders such as the whistleblower themselves, the subject, subjects, witnesses, the wider business line, clients, legal, the board, um, all the way up to the audit committee chair. And then you might need to think about external parties. Um, we had an investigation recently where um, insurers um, were interested to know what's going on, customers, suppliers were concerned, um, potentially also if it's serious regulators or even the police. Um, I mean, I could go on, <laughs> but perhaps I should stop there to see if there's any um, questions or you have any follow-up questions, Andrew. Yeah, you just, to, just to pick on something you said, you mentioned stakeholders. So if we can explore that in a, uh, in a bit more detail, um, who, who should receive whistleblower reports and who should get involved uh, in the investigation? So I think you need to have really clear internal procedures setting out in advance um, to whom any escalation of serious allegations should be made. And that will typically be a member of the senior management team in the legal or compliance function. Um, and they, in turn, should have a direct reporting line to the board or audit committee. You also may need to have an alternative procedure should an allegation come in about a board member or the very person who is designated to deal with whistleblowing reports. Um, I've seen in the past, depending on the seriousness, size and complexity of an issue, where a subcommittee of the board has been convened, called you know, an investigations committee, independent investigations committee, to oversee the investigation, and act as a steering committee. Um, and they need to be obviously completely independent. So no one implicated, even on the periphery, should be part of that. Um, and then in terms of actually doing the investigation, if the, invest if the organization is large enough, then you're likely to have your own um, in-house team. Um, but if not, you may need to rely on external support. And the other aspect to think about is protecting the business as usual. So if this is a, a you know, large range wide ranging investigation that can sometimes take up considerable energy away from senior people who really need to be doing the day job as well so it's thinking about me, how you can um, protect um, business as usual so a debate that often comes up in these is the in these discussions is the role of invest uh, internal versus external uh, investigators <laughs> and the pros and cons of each i mean what's what's your take uh, on the topic yeah, I mean, this this is quite a hot topic of debate. Um, as you say, you you may well want to use your, your in-house investigations team if you have one. Of course, they know the business really well. Um, they're going to know um, where to look for the evidence and where to find it uh, better than any external party. And they also will know what's expected in terms of company policy and procedure, um, both the conduct of the investigation and the reporting of that investigation. And often they can be better value um, for all of those reasons. On the other hand, it's not always possible to have all the specific expertise or experience in-house. Um, you might need language skills, you might need people who have a particular, particular understanding of a, the culture and a particular geography, um, or a particular, particular technical aspect such as cyber um, or something else. Um, and there, and also you might need, you might just need capacity um, if you don't have a big enough team to handle the particular volume or size of investigations that have come through your whistleblowing hotline. Um, so I think if you are going to use external support, um, oh, sorry, I've got to say, one other key point around using external support is if um, you need that stamp of independence. So if a regulator may be involved, it may be that you have to use external support to have that additional level of, of independence um, to your investigation. 
But of course, you need to hold your um, any external supplier to account on quality and budget. Um, and I've also seen really successful co-sourcing arrangements where you run most of your investigations in-house, um, and you can, but you can turn to a trusted partner to help um, if you need that capacity or particular skill set to augment your current team. I've heard it argued that investigating cases internally can sort of impact impartiality or objectivity or be perceived to impact impartiality or objectivity. Is that something you would agree with? Yeah, I think it's probably uh, more around the perception of, of impartiality or, or independence. I think, you know, all the in-house investigations I've, team, I've seen have very much been, um, you know, top-notch and impartial. But because they are, by their nature, part of the company, that isn't necessarily um, seen in the same way by the regulator or another enforcer who might insist that an external... Uh, clearly independent person is, is investigating. So I guess it comes down to the nature of each individual case and you should probably review on, a, on an ad hoc basis according to the requirements of that case. Yeah, I think it very much comes down to the, the facts of this specific case and the context and you need to do it on absolutely on a case by case basis. Just a reminder, we've got some questions coming in, which we'll um, which we'll get to uh, as we can, uh, go through the discussion. But uh, just a reminder, if you've got any questions, um, then uh, please enter them into the panel and we'll get to them uh, in the course of this discussion. Um, Annabelle, what about the original whistleblower in all this? You know, what, what communication with them is desirable or possible, particularly if they've chosen to remain anonymous? And uh, how do you go about it? So, as you say, it very much depends on their status. Um, if they're anonymous, it's obviously not possible, um, and you should never seek to identify um, seek to identify who the whistleblower is. We've seen some quite famous cases where that's gone horribly wrong. Um, so, but within the legal bounds, I would actually err uh, on more rather than less communication with the whistleblower, if possible. So, if that if they're not completely anonymous or they've come through, um, you know, to a line manager and something's been escalated. Um, they're a source of potentially important information and you need to encourage them to share everything they know so that you can investigate thoroughly and they, they need to be heard. Um, of course, you need to balance this against the need for the organisation to keep things confidential and have a very small circle of knowledge around high stakes investigations and protect both the whistleblower and the person against whom allegations are being made. We've got a question uh, that's come in from the audience. Uh, I'll ask you, you now. Um, do you have any guidance experience in how to investigate people-related grievances, i.e. bullying or harassment? And are there any sort of particular approach you should take with those types of cases? So, so my main focus is around the financial, um, financial fraud and economic crime investigations. But I think some of the um, fundamentals uh, are quite similar. I think... What I would really counsel here is around just treating them people as human beings, um, because these can be extremely, um, you know, tough tough things to raise. People can be scared about losing their jobs. People can be scared about being, you know, um, losing bonuses, you know, losing status, um, and they can be really, really tough. So I think just um, there, I would always seek legal advice. Um, because they can be particularly, excuse me, particularly tricky in terms of um, the legal ins and outs. Um, and, yeah, I think I'll stop there. Sticking with um, audience questions, there's two questions that have come up on a, on a similar theme. Um, mm -hmm. What are the golden do's and don'ts of whistleblowing investigations? And a similar one, what are the most common failings in an investigation? and how can you avoid that? So can you expand on both of those two um, questions? Yeah, so one of the most common failings, I think, in an in investigation, sometimes investigators can get lost in the detail. I think it's really important to put your head up every so often and survey the bigger picture from, a, from a, taking a step back and taking stock. Have we looked everywhere? Is what we understood at the start of the case still the case? What new evidence has come to light and how does that change things? And really just be conscious that investigations are a dynamic process. 
it can change quite significantly during the process. And what about what about the failings? What are the what are the things that typically can go wrong in an investigation, and and how would you suggest you try and avoid those? I think well, I think I touched on this earlier. I think you should never forget that you're working with real people. So that kind of point around the empathy, the understanding, compassion, awareness of mental health and well-being being of all parties involved, all need to be part of the process because ultimately your investigation and how the whistleblower is treated and how the matter is resolved goes to your company culture. Um, and everyone involved, whistleblowers, witnesses, subjects, will all remember how they were made to feel during the process. Another question, uh, I guess, following on on a similar theme from the audience, um, would you recommend offering a dialogue or a meeting to a whistleblower uh, between uh, him or her management? in case of an anonymous complaint? I think I would, I would turn that question back over to the whistleblower um, and say, you know, we will protect your anonymity, but it may be more helpful to resolving this issue, issue if you come and speak to us um, and see what they say. I think you need to be really careful uh, not to pressure anyone to, to um, give up their anonymity. Sure, but give them the chance to uh, um, uh, meet if it's something they wish to. Otherwise, most systems these days can you know, uh, manage effective communications between whistleblowers and the audience, even if they have chosen to remain uh, anonymous. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know, a good system can be absolutely fundamental to the success of an investigation because it is a conduit through which you may be able to, to speak with the whistleblower without them having to divulge who they are. So building that, and it also helps more broadly to sort of build the trust in the system, because I'm sure, um, you know, this has been touched on in the previous sessions and will be touched on in the final session. People aren't going to use your, your whistleblowing speak up lines unless they truly believe they are confidential and they can remain, remain anonymous. And anything you can do in the investigation process to build that trust um, is just a, a virtuous circle, I think. So can we stick with systems then? And, and you touched on you know, the importance of having effective systems in play and how they can support the, the management of investigations. Just, just expand a little bit on what, in your view, makes a good system and how can they really be used effectively to support investigations and, I guess, to encourage reporting in the first place? Yeah, so as I say, I think to, well, to encourage reporting in the first place, I think you need to have lots of different um, routes. So. You know, not everyone will be comfortable doing an email. Some people would rather do a phone message. Some people would rather speak to someone in person. There are lots of different routes. And I think if your system can accommodate all of those, um, then you're more likely to make everyone feel comfortable um, in, in reporting. Um, the trust point can't, can't be overstated. Um, you know, you need to publicize the fact that it's secure and confidential, GDPR compliant, can be run by a third party sometimes that that can give it um, that additional level of um independence but perceived and actual um that may give certain whistle reticent whistleblowers um more confidence um i think it needs to be intuitive and user-friendly um on both sides uh, for the people making the reports but also the people receiving the reports um and i think good functionality such as audit trail searchability, that kind of thing. And also, um, I think useful for potentially generating management information, anonymized, of course, but management information, dashboards and the like for reporting to the board on you know levels of reports, um, progress on investigations and resolutions. We touched on a couple of those points with um, Rachel in last week's um, discussion, but in terms of board reporting, you mentioned dashboards uh, mm -hmm. and their role in board reporting, but what type of information do you, do you typically recommend is reported um, to the board? So I think uh, probably a combination of both qualitative and quantitative information insofar as you can. So in terms of quantitative, um, you know, number of investigations, a comparison to the previous month or the previous year, so we can so people can judge whether things are getting better or worse. Um, number of 
sort of allegations substantiated or not substantiated, um, you might want to somehow bring in some root cause analysis. So you may have kind of subcategories of the types of investigation that you are getting um, and whether, you know, if there's a particular spike um, of particular, say, bullying in a particular office or jurisdiction, you might want to, you know, do a bit of a deeper dive into that. I think all that kind of information can help the board really kind of um, focus in on where potential red flags are within the business and try and try and fix those. And the other point you touched on that came up last week is around the importance of communication. You know, as, as, as we discussed in the webinar last week, you know, you can have the best system in the world and the most effective processes in the world, but if, if those aren't effectively communicated and people don't feel comfortable using systems to report without fear of retaliation uh, or recrimination, then the system's not going to be used. So I think that, that communication piece is, is really vital. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's lots of different ways of doing that. I think, so I've seen at various clients, um, you know, kind of PR campaigns around it with posters up everywhere, um, a link from the um, company intranet directly to the uh, Speak Up page. Um, I think as well, there's a kind of word of mouth. One thing I've seen really effective, um, in a, it was a quite a large organization, a, a big bank. Um, they actually invited some of the uh, investigations and whistleblowing team to talk about, of course, on a completely anonymized basis and generalized basis, so that you, you couldn't, there is no possibility that you could work out exactly what issue they were talking about in terms of specifics of the investigation. But you, in, a, in general terms, they fed back to the business in a town hall about the kind of things that um, were coming up and successful resolutions as well. You know, if, if something, someone's done something really serious, and it's found to be substantiated, then, you know, some organisations now are, you know, effect, that affects their bonus, that affects their promotion prospects, and it's really about behaviour as well as the bottom line. And if people start to hear that, um, on, you know, in their day-to-day -day work, then I think that sends a message in terms of how the Speak Up culture can really improve, improve the, the wider culture of the business. There's another question here, Annabelle. I'm not sure if it's quite within your area of expertise, but this relates back to the requirement of the EU directive. So after providing a feedback to a whistleblower within three months, when can we close a complaint? And how do we deal uh, with things if they came back, come back with additional questions and are not satisfied with the investigation? So I, the, the timelines, the official um, timelines are not my own expertise, but if someone yeah. comes back, um, because they're not comfortable that things have been dealt with, you know, properly, then that that can be a real challenge, I think, because there's only so much you can, can communicate and it presents the risk that if a whistleblower is not satisfied with the route um, they've gone internally and the action the company's taken or not taken, in their opinion, you are more at risk and exposed to them going external, potentially to the media, potentially to a regulator, um, and really, as, as an organisation, you want to avoid that um, and, and keep the uh, issue in-house to investigate yourselves. So I think always have, have the lines of communication open and listen to what they've got to say um, and, and let them come up again and, and raise additional concerns. Thanks. So before we get to the end of our allotted time, but, but before we close, I mean, what, what one key message or key messages would you leave for the audience today to, to walk away with from this, from this discussion? So I think I'll reiterate what I said at the beginning. Planning and preparation is absolutely fundamental and it can get you out of the whole of the trouble later on if you do that exercise fully. Um, the second one would be, again, a reiteration of what I said earlier about not forgetting that you're working with real people. Um, I've seen quite recently um, on LinkedIn and, and around the internet that there's a real focus on this now. You've got to have that empathy, understanding and compassion around all of the people who are involved. Um, and then finally, taking that step back and making sure that every so often you're looking from a bit of a height and going, are we still um, doing the right thing? Are we still looking at the right areas? Have things changed? Should we stop? Um, and taking stock. 
Thanks, Annabelle. So we're just about uh, out of time, but before we close, and I think we've managed to cover the questions that have been raised um, by the audience. So many thanks um, for that. You've got one more minute if you do, do have a last minute question you want to um, raise. But before we close, just a reminder that next week's webinar is the final one in the series. Uh, and I'll be talking to Debbie Ramsey and Lisa, Rand Lisa Randalls from Good Corporation. Uh, and we'll be discussing how to drive uh, an effective speak up culture within an organization. You can click on the link um, to register via our website if you haven't uh, already done so. Um, so I think that's it for today. Uh, Annabelle, thanks very much for joining us today and for sharing your insights. I uh, really enjoyed our discussion. I hope we can do it again sometime. And also thanks to everyone else for participating in this uh, event and for the questions you've submitted. Uh, we hope you found it useful. Uh, please come back to us if you've got additional follow-up questions you want to raise with either ourselves or Annabelle. And we'd also really welcome your feedback on today's event by taking just 30 seconds to complete a very short survey, which you'll see on your screen. Uh, now or when you exit uh, the webinar. Uh, these series of 30-minute webinars are a new uh, approach that we're taking and your feedback is really helpful on uh, how useful you find them and also any suggestions for uh, future events. So thank you all once again. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much for joining us and I hope you can join us again next week. Thanks all. Thank you.